good to be with you. It gives me life. It gives me life to be around raw Christianity, you know? It's like, a, you know, you guys, there's a whole move now not to eat processed food. And I don't, I don't want you to eat any more processed Christianity. Okay, let's go to raw Christianity. Let's just go to raw, intense, vibrant, powerful, potent Christianity. You know, let's just, let's just go to the roots. Let's go down to the very core of, of what this is all about. Let's discover the essence of who Jesus is. And let's celebrate that essence together. And I just feel like, you know, there's, there's been throughout history these, these moves of God's spirit that many have called like Jesus movements. You know, the, the original Jesus movement happened with Jesus himself. <laughs> he, was the, he was the original Jesus movement. And then there's been just throughout history just amazing waves of God's presence. And usually it's among a bunch of young people. And, and, it's, and, it's, and it's often with some help from older folks like me who can come along and just kind of support and coach and, and help. But really the fire, the creativity, the power is often released within the emerging generation of any, any move of God. And, um, and so it actually gives me life. In fact... You know, I just left San Francisco about three years ago and moved up to Redding, California. You guys know where that is? So anyway, I moved up there thinking initially I was just going up for a summer sabbatical, you know, get a little rest with my wife. And uh, unfortunately, the Lord gave us a dream. And, and so we left the city and, and uh, I work with Jesus Culture now. They just moved to Sacramento. I still live in Redding, so I commute back and forth a little bit. But uh, we just got back from the UK. We did a series of gatherings all the way through the country and... And uh, God's doing some great stuff in, in Sacramento, which is awesome. And you guys are connected. You guys are famous in Jesus culture. I hope you know that. Seriously, because everywhere we go, we talk about, you know, your outreach and what God's doing through you. And so you guys got to know that you guys are famous, okay, around the world. Cool. <laughs> well, let's, let's ask the Lord's blessing. We have some more ministry we're going to do after I speak, but... Um, Let's get into the Word for a few minutes, and then we're going to take some time and just prophesy over people and minister as the Lord leads. So let's just lift up our hearts to the Lord for a second and ask His presence to come. And this isn't just a, a, this isn't a processed prayer, you guys. This is a raw prayer. So I want you to just really actually take it seriously and draw on Jesus for a few minutes, okay? And so, Father, we ask you right now to move in this room. We ask you to awaken the inner parts of our heart, Lord, to be able to grab a hold of new things tonight. We pray, Lord, that you'd speak to us and that we would walk away with something added to us that would actually carry us into your purposes in a greater way. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to tell you a story as we get started. The story is about a guy, actually it's about really three guys, who were out at war. And this was somewhere in Europe and they had, this was like, you know, in the 15th, 16th century and they had just, like, fought off the enemy, you know, probably 20, 30 miles away. And they had ended this war, and they were tattered, and they were broken, and they were dirty, and they had spatters of blood on themselves. But the war was over, the, the enemy had surrendered, and they went home to their homeland. And they began to walk back to their village. And on their way back, they started walking through different villages that they had really liberated because the enemy was so crazy. He was going to come in and just burn the whole thing to the ground. But these guys ended up being the victors, the, the ones who had saved really the whole land. And here they are walking back to their, to their village, their home village. But on the way, they were super hungry and tired. So they walked into this village and they knocked on a few doors. They said, hey, you know, can you guys scare, spare any food? He said, no, go away, we don't want you. And people wouldn't even be, kind of crack open their, their curtains a little bit. Get out of here, we don't want you. Well, we just fought a war for you. We just liberated you. No, we don't want you. Please go away. And after they hit the second door and the third door and the fourth door, they, they just realized that the people were so wounded. The people were so broken and hurting in their hearts that they couldn't do anything. They just realized that at the end of this thing that it wasn't because they were bad people. And it wasn't because they didn't appreciate the fact that they had been fought for and a victory had been achieved. It wasn't on, on account of those things. It was just the people were so weary and so embattled that they just couldn't, 
They couldn't trust again. They couldn't open their doors. They couldn't share their food because they thought, we only have a very small amount and we need all that we have. And so one of the guys just had a brilliant idea. They went to the, the city square and he found an old kettle and some other guys, the other two guys gathered some wood and they, they started stoking a fire. And they put this kettle on there after they'd filled it with water from the well in the city square. And then one of the men, the leader, went to his knapsack and he pulled out this piece of velvet and he began to unwrap it. And in the velvet was this beautiful stone. And he took the stone and he threw it in the pot. And then they began to stir it. And they began to taste it. And they began to smile at each other because they were making something very powerful and potent. And pretty soon, all the people in the village houses that were around the public square began to kind of crack their windows and say, what are these guys doing? And what are they tasting? And, and pretty soon, they began to open their doors and kind of wander out and kind of take a peek and look. And what's going on here? And then pretty soon, they wandered over into the square and they said, wow, what are you guys cooking? So we're cooking some stone soup. They said, wow, how does it taste? And took a taste and it tastes really good, but it could show you some onions. <laughs> and so one of the guys said, well, I have some onions in my house. I'll bring the onions over. So they run back to their house and they get some onions and chop them up and throw them in the soup. And they say, somebody else comes up, how does it taste? Oh, it tastes really good, but it could really use some good meat in here. My apologies to the vegans in the room. But, you know, it needed some meat. <laughs> and so, anyway, they got, so, mmm, that's really good. You know, somebody else brought in some carrots and somebody else brought in some potatoes. And pretty soon they had this massive pot of food cooking and they, somebody brought in some corn, somebody brought in some beans. And within about an hour they had this amazing, amazing feast and all the villagers came out and shared in this amazing feast. And not only were they fed, but their hearts were healed because they found a place of contribution and community together. You guys have probably heard some version of that story before, right? But I want you to read this passage with me, and I want you to kind of understand this passage in the light of the story of Stone Soup. Stone Soup. It says here in verse 15 of chapter 1 of Ephesians, it says, Therefore, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him.